This is Decentralized Radio. I'm Tristan. And I'm Ryan. The goal of this podcast is to help educate you on how to live your most optimal life. We will host industry expert guests to shed light on topics that matter. We are not gurus, rather two individuals who have had to pave their own path to health and vitality independent of the centralized systems that plague modern society. On today's episode, Ryan and I discuss with Max Golhane, an MD who's a general practice registrar with an interest in lifestyle medicine, metabolic disease reversal, pre-pregnancy nutrition, and circadian health. Max went down his own self-healing rabbit hole, at first with a pharmaceutical-based care that lacked effectiveness, and thus made him delve deeper into interventional lifestyle changes and the actual fundamental root cause of disease. He now hosts the Regenerative Health Podcast, where he interviews guests to talk about things that we love to talk about as well, including regenerative agriculture, experts in certain areas of health, nutrition, and lifestyle. He really takes a holistic approach to health, and it was a really great conversation here we had with Max, so you're going to like this episode a lot. All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Decentralized Radio. Today we're joined by I think our most like longest distance guest so far, Dr. Max Gullane. How's it going, Max? Hey guys, hi Tristan, hi Ryan. Thanks for having me on your show, Max. If you're not watching the uh, YouTube video, it's uh, early morning in Australia, so he's got the the red light going, blue blockers. I love it. And Ryan and I are fitting the part as well down here in Ryan's basement, so. I'm trying. I'm making the best of a bad situation. It's sort of a lose-lose in the basement. We were going to podcast outside, but there's a little bit too many variables. So room for improvement. Yeah, pe- people, I, I sometimes have to rock the hat inside mm-hmm. um, when I've got overhead uh, artificial light at, at an unfavorable recording time. And uh, yeah, people wondering why I'm wearing a hat <laughs> indoors. And um, I see you gentlemen uh, are doing the same thing. So uh, glad I'm not the only one. Yeah, so we'll have to get into that a bit. Definitely have been listening to a lot of your podcasts um, and guests that you've had on on light and quantum health, which has been awesome. But I guess a bit of background for the listeners who maybe aren't familiar with you, Max. I know, yeah, are you, are you I guess the equivalent to like a general practitioner down in Australia? And how did you get into medicine? And how has kind of like your viewpoint of all things changed? Let's we can dive into that maybe a little bit. Yeah, so I'm a, a training general practitioner, um, or family medicine is what it's sometimes called, and I'm about a, a year into or half a year into uh, like a two year training program. I've been working as a doctor for about five years now, um, and before that was doing emergency medicine work and a bit of general hospital work. But I but I guess what I'm interested in is more holistic health. And health that's not kind of uh, related to uh, solely prescribing medications and and medicating symptoms of various you know individual organ diseases. And the way I got into this is I I, I wanted to do, do medicine and took a little bit of a long way round. I did a bit of lab research, um, and then once I was in medicine, I did some public health. So it took me a little bit um, longer. But in in that time, I had my own health journey, and you know, I, I interview doctors in my podcast, and almost invariably, um, the doctors who are considering ways of practice that look at the maybe the underlying causes of disease, they you, they didn't kind of just by default arrive at that position. They all had to go, undergo their own health journey. And that's because the way that we get taught in medical school is not um, is in not any way related to helping us really understand fundamentally and prevent um, disease. So my my story was that I was following a I guess a standard Australian diet, not heaps of junk food by any means, but uh, and I've never been overweight or obese, but. I was eating a lot of grains, um, especially around the time of um, working out. Like I did a lot of cycling and I would eat, um, you know, before I'd go cycling, I'd have a carton of what, what's called here up and go, but it's essentially like a chocolatey, um, a chocolate flavored, like, you know, preparation energy drink. Um, it's, and essentially just has like oats and 
um, sugar and it's it's an emotional vegetable oil. So I'd be drinking those and I'd be coming home and having like, yeah, poats, oats or a porridge, um, fruits, all this kind of thing. And uh, yeah, just had really bad acne. And I went through the, the kind of traditional medical system and got escalated dosing of topical acne treatment and then oral antibiotics and then you know the big wacky <laughs> the big whack which is a, a medication called isotretinoin or, or Ac- roaccutane that you, your listeners might know about and it, you can recognize someone who's on roaccutane maybe at school or at uni because they have um very very dry lips or, or they're always putting the lip lip balm on and their their eyes can be slightly red and their, their skin is very photosensitive so it's a it's a heavy duty drug and it, and if you're observant you can actually recognize who's on it and it works very well it does um it's uh you know effective cure but um what the whole time that this was happening over a period of years no no dermatologist or general practitioner told me hey um you know this is a a problem that can be um, essentially cured when we remove processed food and grains from the diet. So I was um, going through medical school and I had my run in with Roaccutane. I just stopped it because I was, I was getting quite um, unpleasant uh, mood side effects. And, uh, and, and then around 2017, I uh, moved in with a, a good friend of mine and we decided we'd do a plant-based diet. And the friend that, that I'm, that I live with, he's a, you know, he's a very uh, forward thinking guy, very smart guy. And um, maybe 2017, we were the early adopters of the, of plant-based eating, but I uh, thought it'd be the right reason, do it, doing the right thing for the right reason with regard to planet health, uh, environmental health, um, animal rights, you know, all, all the kind of buzz, buzz points that even uh, only ramping up now um, in a, in, in the mainstream discourse. And so I thought, Oh, hang on. Well, We'll do this. Maybe that will help with my acne. Um, you know, fast forward six months, seven months, and the complete opposite. So we we were eating, uh, and again, I was I've never I've never been eating really really junk food, but it was things like whole grain breads with you know avocado and olive oil, um, chia chia um, you know chia pudding kind of um, with with like oats and quinoa and you know blueberries. Um, soy uh what's it called tofu and like tofu a little bit of kangaroo and salmon so it wasn't completely uh plant-based but uh lots of uh, legumes and and uh these types of foods and yeah i mean not only did the acne get worse but uh, i had just irritable bowel symptoms frequent upper respiratory tract infections um just yeah periods of you know anxiety that, that was just yeah not not really me and uh, so so this was my experiment and my delving into uh, the the plant based kind of eating world and that was a springboard and i like to say especially when i'm talking about behavioral motiv- motivational interviewing to my patients it's like the lower you go down that the higher the trampoline to bounce back out of that so uh, you got to you got to find the trough to to then get to the peak and yeah that was at that point in third year third year uni i found a youtube channel called low carb down under and it for your for your listeners it's it's a it's a channel that has talks and presentations by a range of doctors on ba- basically low carb so more traditional just low carb eating for um, management of metabolic diseases but all kinds of other stuff so i, I found that um did a low carb diet acne went away found sean baker and paul saladino decided to ditch the the plants as well pure carnivore for at least eight months of just really strict um steak and eggs felt really good um and then uh since then i've kind of been a bit more liberal just because i, I solved the initial reason why um i needed to go on it and um right now about 80 80 to 90 percent meat um and then we'll add in a little bit of fruit um, ideally more seasonally and a little bit of, um, you know, fermented vegetables here and there. And, and obviously not to be too restrictive when I'm out eating, but essentially I found my own medical curriculum um, that was parallel to what uh, I'd been taught throughout medical school and throughout clinical practice. Um, and in the past year and a half, been delving into the the Jack Cruz stuff and the quantum and uh, mitochondrial medicine. So it's almost a, it's a story of parallel learning and um, not one of um, 
I guess, centralized. I mean, you, you guys called the decentralized radio. It was like a decentralized medical curriculum. And now that I'm practicing in general practice, I'm seeing my own patients. Um, I find myself applying. <laughs> well, obviously, I'm applying what what I learned traditionally and what I'm continuing to learn from a family medicine point of view. But a lot of the reasons why people go to GPs, oh, I'm tired, or oh, I want to lose weight, the the mainstream curriculum doesn't have a satisfying answer for these people at all, um, and they are commonly prescribed drugs like a Zempic, which is um, a medication that um, it's injectable medication that's actually diabetic medication that helps them lose weight. And we could talk about that, but uh, it, it, they don't get a satisfying answer from the pill based or the medication based paradigm. So the the skills or the knowledge that I learned on myself and then just through, through, through private study has been really helpful in giving a lot of patients um, help with regard to weight loss, with regard to fertility, with regard to um, a range of other conditions. So it's been great to be able to actually offer um, solutions. And, you know, you hear these career GPs and they're quite jaded uh, and they just say flatly that lifestyle doesn't work because as part of our learning, we always say, okay, lifestyle measures first, then we go to the drugs. But it's almost given like lip service and in that, oh yeah, I tried lifestyle, but Patients aren't compliant with lifestyle. Lifestyle doesn't work, and, and essentially, to me, that 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 means that um, the advice that you're giving is simply not effective. But um, all that all that to say, the the learning and the you know interesting rabbit holes and the the understanding disease at a fundamental level has really allowed me to to help people more effectively. So yeah, that's essentially um, where I'm at at the moment. Hey, friend! Thanks for listening. If you really enjoy this podcast. It would be really appreciated if you left us a five-star review on Spotify, Apple, or subscribe to our content on YouTube. This helps us get to a larger reach and a larger audience to spread this wonderful free education. No, I mean, that's that's fantastic. I mean, it's so relatable to so many people's stories that we talk to, even our own. I mean, it's sort of like you mentioned earlier. I feel like to dive into this stuff, you have to have something sort of traumatic in some sense, shape, or form happen to yourself before you sort of gain that innate curiosity or you go through the system and you don't find the help that you're looking for, the answers you're looking for. So it kind of falls into your lap and you have to make that hard decision of, well, am I going to do the diligence and do the research and try to figure this thing out? Or am I just sort of going to stop here? And that's sort of a sort of two choice. It's a fork in the road that I think everyone will face in that scenario. Um, I sort of want to go back before we dive into some of the more more compelling stuff, but sort of go back into your your original wheelhouse of medicine and talk about the conventional system a little bit. Because you mentioned Ozempic, which is, which is like you mentioned, a weight, very popular weight loss drug right now. But another one that I see commonly prescribed, not for weight loss, but another very common problem in Western culture, um, and one that at least half of my family is on chronically, um, is, is omeprazole for acid reflux. And I think there's a lot of misconceptions about these drugs, the reasons they, they work, obviously, um, but the damage that they may be doing on the sidelines that they don't know about. And I think you made a really good point about lifestyle, sort of getting lip service from doctors. And I think that goes into a few things fold. And you would know more than me actually working in practice and talking to other GPs and stuff like that. But sort of what I see is I don't think they truly have the knowledge themselves to give in some sense, um, or they have the wrong knowledge, or they themselves don't practice any of the things that they're telling the patient. Um, I can't really think of one doctor I've had that's really got their skin in the game as far as fitness or any of that stuff goes, even on a very general basis. So I'd love to sort of talk about some of the, some of the, the pit, I mean, you sort of mentioned some of the pitfalls, but uh, some of the solutions to this as well. Like how do we get this, this sort of education out there so that we can have doctors that are actually delivering solutions to their patients through lifestyle services like you're doing now and uh, stuff like that. I think it's changing over the last couple of years, but I'd love to hear your perspective as as a doctor. Yeah. And look, I, d I don't blame my colleagues. Often they're following their own advice or they're following the advice that they're giving to patients that isn't working. So um, it, it's, it's, it's a sad situation where um, there's there's, there's some things aren't working, but they're, they're being, they're adherent to often to their own advice. So what, what that means is that, and I did a talk about this when I, when, when I, um, 
basically analyzed these, you know, the, when the Australian dietary guidelines have come in and, you know, I plotted the rates of overweight and obesity and, you know, you can see each iteration, each, each edition of the dietary guidelines and the, 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 the prevalence of overweight and obesity is just keeping going up and to the right. <laughs> and, and um, you know, we can talk about correlations, but essentially uh, it seems like the dietary guidelines are definitely um, a component uh, cause in in just the ongoing upward progression of that line. So again, I don't like to uh, you know bag out my my colleagues too much because they are simply you know stuck in a system. And as you said earlier, Ryan, they haven't had that um, impetus or that for whatever reason to really dig down deep and then do that their, their own research and understanding. The the Omeprazole, omeprazole is a cl- from a class of medication called proton pump inhibitors, and essentially they reduce the, the stomach's ability to make um, acid. And they do have a have a role in in a, in the acute phase and in cases of bleeding from the GI tract. In the cases of um, you know acute gastritis, they're, they're great medications. They work very well. But the the problem is that when people get put on them long term. And they're simply just an, uh, a pill, a medication, a Band-Aid for um, the un- underlying problem. And if that's reflux, then you're probably ingesting substances or food products, um, commonly uh, seed oils, um, I-, I see, I think, is is a main driver. That is driving the, driving the underlying um, uh, inflammation. Or And then the, the PPI is simply just masking the symptoms and giving you symptomatic relief. The problem, as you mentioned, is that long-term use of PPIs is associated with vitamin B12 deficiency. It's associated with non-osteoporotic, crush fract- uh, non-osteoporotic uh, bone fractures. It's associated with uh, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. There's a range of problems that you can get if you stick on these medications long-term because there's a physiological reason why you're stomach acid is a ph of 1.5 <laughs> like you you mess with that system um it's a complex system if you mess with it and um, there's going to be consequences and often there can be unintended consequences so um that obviously you can see that when i um, mean you know, the stomach needs to be acidic because it 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 is highly highly um it, it kills a lot of bacterial pathogens so when you mess with that you can get things like SIBO. so um i would the the tendency to and I see patients that get left on these for for years. The tendency is is to it's easier to leave a patient on a um, a proton pump inhibitor than work, walk them through all those steps of of removing processed foods, particularly and and improving their gut health. In terms of how to help more doctors um, uh, like change practice, to be honest, I think that you know I'm I'm, I'm split between this idea of it's. It's going to be mostly a, a patient-led. Well, I think it is. It's going to be a patient-led change. Um, and there's a there's a really nice doctor in the UK called Dr. David Unwin, who you know had was coming to the end of his career and was very disillusioned. And then um, his patient had come in and he lost heaps of weight just by simply going keto. And he had the humility to actually listen to that patient and. Um, was then able to change his practice and was open-minded enough. So essentially, I think when people talk to their doctor and say, I've had so much benefit just seeing the morning sunrise, um, perhaps as one example of a lifestyle change, eventually the doctors that are um, a little bit aware will, will be receptive and, and, and make, make changes or be, at least ask questions. But um, in terms of waiting or hoping for wholesale change from a top-down level, I'm I'm not waiting for that, and I don't think that's um, I don't think that's going to be enough to help patients um, on a wide scale um, in a, in a short time frame. So that's why I mean that's why what you guys are doing are great, and what I try to do with with my YouTube channel is because it's much more effective to provide a message and then allow it to be received by people who are ready. Um, rather than um, waiting for for top down change, have you spoken a lot with colleagues about like you know you're talking about implementing a lot of these lifestyle practices or changes interventions with your patients now? Um, obviously, there's a lot of you know open minded colleagues on social media and like minded individuals. But how about you know local colleagues you went to medical school with? Are they receptive? 
to these ideas or, or kind of what's like the average, you know, is there criticisms of, of what you're doing? Do you share that information? I guess kind of what's the feel there when you're just talking with, with more local practitioners about these things, if you do? Yeah. So look in medical school and, you know, general practice training, people like, they just want to get through the program. <laughs> they, the uh, they just want to get, yeah, they just want to get the grades. They want to pass. And then once they're, you know, out of med- medical school in the, in the workforce, they just want to hurry up and get their, their GP training. They're going to, they've got limited bandwidth with everything else going on at home and living their lives to, um, you know, take a, a, a position that is, you know, very uh, uh, heterodox or, or orthogonal to what is being, being told. The, so for that reason, you know, it's it's not it's something that a lot of people, uh, even colleagues, are, are really that interested in. Um, one or two are, um, but yeah, not not on the on the whole. Then they aren't. The point about that, and I guess maybe some of the the, the older GPs, um, you know, they're very very much had their own opinion about how things should be done. And again, it's very difficult to change if you've been doing the same thing for for twenty years. But um, you know, look, my I'm I'm down here in Albury, New South Wales, and my mentor here, um, who is a very very intelligent guy, and um, you know, he made some changes after he had a, a brush in with uh, metabolic disease. You know, we're 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 trying to, I guess, be a little bit of a, a hub, and hopefully build a bit of momentum, um, and then have that um, kind of local change that, that maybe more more doctors are interested in, but. Um, you know, at the beginning of an exponential curve, it's like flat, as you both know. So uh, I feel like that's where we're at at the moment. But once that tipping point is reached and that inflection point arrives, then things can change. But we're very much in that that flat stage, I think. Yeah, no, I, I, I tend to agree. And I, th- I really agree with your statement earlier that you said about patients leading the way. I feel like that's the only way anything's going to happen on, on any large scale or even a small scale, really, because... I just don't think the incentive is there. I mean, there's definitely not incentive from a drug company perspective. Um, so they're not going to, you know, give money to medical schools to teach how to eat real food and all this other stuff that we like to talk about. Um, I do kind of want to uh, get into some of the quantum stuff just because I find it so fascinating. I know you've been sort of diving into it as well. You've had people like Jack Cruz on your podcast, some really dense, but really like thought provoking episodes. Um, super like mind benders uh, on water and light and magnetism, all this crazy stuff. I'd love just to hear what brought you to having those discussions on your podcast versus just staying in the nutrition space. Because I feel like there's sort of these two, these two uh, camps that people seem to sit in. Um, and you've sort of began to merge those two together between the food crowd and the, all this other sort of lack of a better word, woo woo stuff when light water and touching earth and all that stuff. What kind of brought you to that? Were there things that you were experiencing that you needed like some deeper knowledge on? Were there things that you were noticing with patients that were not getting all the answers through just simple uh, through lifestyle change or what sort of brought about those discussions for you? Yeah, that's a, that's a really great question, Ryan. And, and that's exactly what I'm trying to do. It's I'm trying to bridge these schools of thought from the dietary predominant um, low carb keto carnivore which has very, very established um, leaders who are doing incredible work and um, they, they are, they're really helping people and guys like Paul Saladino, Bake, Sean Baker, um, the, all the low-carb guys are, are really helping. Um, and then there's this other school of thought, which is prominently led by Jack Cruz, which he, and, and, and what he's talking about is that there are more fundamental drivers of health that go below biochemistry. So whereas the food predominant people are talking about mainly the hormonal model of obesity and and the degree to which different macronutrients provoke insulin and um, uh, leptin kind of releases and these these type of hormonal biochemical pathways what dr jack cruz has done um, because he is i mean he's incredibly brilliant um, scientist researcher Um, you know he's a he's a savant essentially Um, he is basically taking it down a level or multiple levels, but I'm only at the level of analysis of his bio, biophysics approach. And he's interpreting and analyzing human health 
um, and the way that human health is governed from a physics point of view. And the fundamental drivers of physics that he um, well, that exist are, you know, the light, water, and the magnetism. So it's a, uh, in my mind, it's a more granular analysis. But um, the the way or the the issue that I I guess um, see is that it's it's he's so far ahead that it needs a degree of translation. But to 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 answer your question about how I found it and why I, I've, I've been talking more about it is, uh, I think it it was just inevitable that when you're exploring these. Um, alternative. Well, I wouldn't. I don't want to call it alternative because it's it's um, more more fundamental um, causes of disease that you're going to come across his work. And um, but what what I guess I I'd like to think that I've got a, a pretty finely tuned BS meter. And when I read his stuff, even though it didn't make a lot of sense um, because I didn't have the fundamental knowledge, the the, the, the foundational knowledge to analyze it, it, it actually um, it made sense in my mind. I had an intuition that um, what he was saying is correct, so um, it was up to me then to do my do more research to then make sense of it. And for that reason, I think that uh, a lot of what he's saying is 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 really really effective and and has the potential to help a, a whole bunch of people. And I don't want to degrade the effectiveness of a simple low carb diet. And within these um, spheres, especially online. Um, and especially when you hear, uh, you know, somewhat, um, ex- somewhat polarized rhetoric from from someone like Jack Cruz, you know, and he's attacking the food gurus, and you know, it's not the food. Uh, I can see where he's coming from, and he's obviously dealing with very, very sick, sick patients who have, um, you know, haven't been able to be helped by any of the other um, alternative health practitioners, or functional medicine, or all the other um, diet based by. Based programs, but um, you know, I see in clinic all the time how effective it is. Just simply reducing carbs to you know fifty, twenty five grams a day, it, it is is very very easy. So to 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 reverse metabolic diseases. So what what I want to the point I want to make is that we've got a smorgasbord of lifestyle interventions, and our job as um, lifestyle doctors and is to understand the patient's needs, understand where they're at, understand what they're capable of, understand what um, they're willing to change and then offer them the intervention that we think is most effective for them at that point for their condition. So for that that reason, um, I, yeah, I'm integrating the light, the water, the magnetism, integrating the dietary stuff um, and hopefully building a toolbox to, I guess, better offer my patients um, solutions. Are you interested in 100% grass-fed, grass-finished bison meat? I'm excited to be a partner with Falls Family Ranches. Based in Wyoming, Falls Family Ranches is raising high-quality bison meat the way nature intended. As a native large ruminant of North America, bison is one of the most nutrient-dense foods you can consume. If you're interested in trying out their bison boxes, Use code Tristan, T-R-I-S-T-A-N, 10, for 10% off your first order. Yeah, I think I think it's great. I, I really wish, I hope that we have more folks like you. I mean, that's really our goal here as well because, I mean, we're both, you know, we're tired of the diet dogma. I talked a lot about that in, in my book and just like you get into these diet wars and then you get into the quantum space where, I mean, to be honest, it's a giant echo chamber there as well. So it's it's really important, I think, for people to even step up and out of these perspectives and and realize that there are, you know, it's a multi, you know, faceted approach to optimal health. But at the same time, yeah, it depends how far along you are, like you're saying on this healing journey or how deep into your chronic disease you may be, because obviously it'll have to be more drastic. And yeah, Jack, I think it's getting like the worst of the worst situation. So it's like extremely important. I mean, these people are need to take every measure, but yeah, the, the diet still matters. And, you know, he still talked about that a lot in his early days. So I think it's, it's, it's obviously important, but everyone has, you know, their specialty. And, and that's what you have to realize with all these health influencers is like they have their niche and they usually write a book about it or two or seven, like Dave Asprey or something to make more money. But, um, that's like what it's about. And you have to be able to hand pick this, you know, what are the key takeaways and then how do you apply it to your environment and your bio individuality? So I think that's, 
important for me. It's, it's, it's really funny because I was, I mean, I've been wearing blue light blockers for like five years, five and a half years now because I had a concussion and I was into biohacking and I was like, yeah, EMFs are bad. Blue light is bad, but it's like, it was very surface level. And now it's interesting to take this deeper dive. Um, and yeah, of course, food. And I love your podcast name too, because it's called Regenerative Health. So it's like right there, you're you're bridging a gap between like health, the food system, um, and and that's important too because you it's all connected uh, in reality. And decentralization is about, like I said, taking all of that and being able to apply it to yourself. But the problem is that I see is people just want a simple fix. So they want to just go to Max and be like, Max, just, just tell me what to do. You know, I just, do I need to just cut carbs and I'll be good. And maybe that is, and it's, maybe it's going to help them like get 80, 90% of the way there. But I'm curious how you see that. Um, how do you think we change the mindset of people in terms of like wanting to empower them to, to learn these types of things? And then also for like the quantum space in general, how do we, better this education you're talking about translation of these topics for me it's like the biggest issue because it's obviously very complex but do they really need to know quantum mechanics and you know physics to just be truly optimal probably not but i'm curious on what you think yeah and in terms of help getting people interested or, or more along the line it's it's they have to hit rock bottom in and whatever that rock bottom looks like for them um, that's the crux of behavior change. And look, I, I sat down on the weekend with David Bushel and he was a, an agronomist where well, he still is a practicing agronomist. And he, um, for you know, 25 years has been writing basically prescriptions for herbicides, fungicides, um, fertilizers for farmers. And they'd come back and they'd say, oh, David, I've got a, a crop of Patterson's curse. What, what do I do? He's like, okay, spray this. And then, oh, I've got, now this is growing. Okay, spray this. So he um, he said to me the exact same thing, which is what I see in, in clinic is that people make ch changes and they make changes on their farm when they have you know a bad season or um, the, the chemicals stop working. It's the same thing with with human health, people make a change when they have their heart attack, when they get a, a cancer diagnosis, and it's unfortunate and it, it's often brutal, but that's that's hum, human nature. So um, the 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 wider spread change will probably happen when more and more people get getting sicker and sicker, and we can speculate about that. But I feel like as the food system continues to industrialize, as the use of chemical herbicides continues to induce, continues to increase as people's exposure to to non native uh, EMF uh, electromagnetic fields from things like Wi Fi um, increase and, and chronic blue light exposure. People are getting sicker at, at younger ages, and it's something that I've noticed anecdotally. I mean, the number of people who are grey at and balding at ages that their fathers and their generations above, you know, it took them to the age of 55, 60 before their dads went gray and they're going gray at, you know, age of, of, of 32. And what I think that reflects is a lot of what Jack Cruz is talking about. And it's, and it, and it, it's probably reflecting this idea of mitochondrial heteroplasmy where we're, where our environment is interfering so much with the ability of our mitochondria to function that they accumulate these mutations and then um, the, the disease essentially manifests when uh, you get an amount of dysfunction of the mitochondria inside your cells. So the, the, to answer that question, I think that as more people get sicker um, and, and we're seeing like di increasing diagnosis of cancers and like, um, you know, I interviewed a gastroenterologist and, and you know, he sees like, he sees biliary and bowel cancers at younger and younger ages and, you know, these patients, you, you do their weight, me waist measurement and their height, and they're invariably got to raise waist to height ratio indicative of visceral fat. So um, there's there's all these reasons and, and why people are getting sicker at younger ages. So I think the the amount of, I guess, buy-in will be related to how um, sick people get, which sounds a little bit morbid, but I, I honestly think that's not, that's, not, um, that's not an opinion, that's just a ref well, it is an opinion, but it's simply just a reflection of human nature. Um, to to and then I guess the the point about translation um, and the quantum stuff, uh, I I think that 
you're right, Tristan, that it's not people are not necessarily going to have to know about the wavelength of ultraviolet light that the mitochondria emit, um, you know, subcellularly to trigger DNA replication and cellular signaling. It's not something that people need to know. Um, but having said that, the translation of it is going to be through intelligent people, um, you know, like you, like uh, guys like Jalal. I don't know if you follow Jalal um, on, on Instagram. He's just not far from me in Sydney. He's a quantum dentist and he's he's done an incredibly deep dive and is advocating this. Um, Kerry Bennett and Sarah Kleiner, they're lovely ladies and they're doing amazing work to bring this message from a more female point of view. Um, Dr. Stillman, I've, I've uh, messaged him a little bit on, on Instagram and he seems to be, um, again, translating things quite well. But I think that we're going to need to rely on people to um, do the, the research that Jack Cruz is prompting people to do and then, yes, tr- translate that message into actionable and steps for, for more lay people. Yeah, I mean, I think for me talking to people because I I kind of I talk about this stuff all the time. I was telling uh, Tristan the other day that we were at a at a festival, and I actually got into a conversation with somebody who was protesting, and I he was wearing sunglasses, and I started talking to him about melanin just just cause just to see what I, I wanted to see what a complete, for lack of a better word, normie would think if I just started talking to them about this stuff, and it, it just completely goes just in one ear out the other ear, and so I think like part of the problem like along with that, that translation sort of things like, yes, all the things you said are completely true. I feel like to even get into the realm of even finding these things, you have to hit some sort of really bad low in your health to even seek it out to some degree. Um, but then to even believe it is like, is like another thing because I'll, I'll talk to people in my circle that know my health history very well. And they've seen the successes I've had over the last three years with my health. Uh, through the various things that we've just talked about, light exposure, changing diet, lifestyle, pretty much changing every aspect of my entire life compared to five years ago. And they sort of will listen about it, but I, they don't they don't think about it to the degree of importance that I think exists, like the the level of damage that goes on subliminally that we don't see around us. And me and Tristan were having a conversation about this earlier about, about EMF in general is that it, you, it's hard to fear something or think about something being a problem that you with your eyes physically can't see. I think that's just a, another, a very human problem to have. It's like a war going on across the world. If we can't see it, we don't really think about how bad it is and all of these various things. It's, if it's not clear, it's sort of difficult. So yeah. I think it's good to have people like you sort of making these consumable as sort of being that mediator in between the experts, because sometimes it, it's hard to get to that point of acceptance that these things are real. And actually we were talking about uh, Robert O. Becker earlier, which Jack Cruz likes to talk about orthopedic surgeon and uh, Tristan just finished reading uh, the, the body electric. And we were talking about some of his work and how basically he got thrown under the bus after all this stuff happened and stopped funding his research and all these various things. And so I think there's, there's just a lot of, there's a lot of density in these topics. And so the, the question I suppose I would have is, how do you bring these up to patients? How do you get them to consider these things if someone comes to you that you feel like maybe maybe like low carb isn't taking them all the way, but how do you bring up these conversations with, with that normal person to get them to consider, hey, maybe take out the AirPods or hey, maybe go outside in the morning, you know? Yeah, yeah. And I just want to make the point that in terms of digestibility, I want to draw an analogy to the seed to seed oils because just like you made the really good point that it's difficult for people to recognize a threat that they can't visually see, um, and you know Wi-Fi is a form of it's a form of light. It's just a form of non-visible light that's affecting our our, our bodies. Essentially, um, the seed oils and the you know things like canola oil, vegetable oil that it, it have infiltrated the food supply and exist in deep fryers and in Uber Eats and restaurant food. It's a similar analogy because they they're not immediately for most people palatable. It can't be recognised as as directly you know offensively palatable, but they and they have a cumulative negative effect. You know, one one seed oil meal is not going to kill you, but if you're eating um, deep fried fries, uh, French fries every single day, then you're gonna you're gonna get the consequences. So as if you're gonna sleep if you sleep next to your Wi-Fi router every night. You know, one night's not going to kill you, but if you do it every single night, that that's the cumulative harm. 
so that I, I actually interviewed seed oil disrespecter. I'm sure both of you guys know him. He's a, uh, he's a doctor from the U S in Kentucky or Carolina. And he, the, the innovation and the brilliance of him that he has is that he's taken this really complex topic, which is, um, you know, the increased photosensitivity from consuming a high omega-6 diet, the, the t- toxic breakdown products of linoleic acid. He's he's digested that message, he's interpreted it, and then he spits it out in incredibly funny, really small memes that are very easily digestible by lay people. So you, you, you talked about sunglasses and, you know, I, you know when, when a patient comes in and we've got time, you know, I'll say, look, um, about the sunglasses, when, you, when you're blocking light information into your retina, um, but you're still getting an exposure on your skin, you've got, an, you've got a confusing incongruent message between your skin and your eyes and, and, and your, your, your body fails to make um, important hormones that allow the skin to darken, you can paradoxically increase your likelihood of burning. So we, what I think is we need a seed oil disrespecter equivalent for Jack Cruz's work, someone who can just spit out a meme, um, maybe one of you two. There you that, go, Tristan, uh, there you go, the angle. Just, yeah, meme, they can just, just meme everything. Yeah, just can meme it out. Um, maybe sunglass disrespecter, I don't know, or sunscreen disrespecter. Uh, and uh, that, that I think that's going to be a great like entry point um, for for this type of stuff. But in terms of how I talk about it, so yeah, it's a it's a great point. Um, so I raise this topic with people who uh, very, very occasionally, I'll, and and since I interviewed with um, Dr. Anthony Chafee, I've had a lot of um, you know carnivore type guests and. Often I'll see, I've seen a couple who are still, and again, they're in the really sick basket. They're still having symptoms or they're still not thriving despite being on carnivore. And, um, you know, I'll say to them, look, well, if that's the case, then we're, we're obviously not treating what's going on, you know, even further underneath. And at that point, I've, I've actually, I don't have one with me, but I've got a flyer. I just made a really simple uh, A5 flyer with basically six points to do and it just explains it just says you know light light shapes health um this the disruption of your circadian rhythm can influence your health in all these different ways and it just has simple points about seeing see the sunrise in the morning without wearing glasses get check in with the sun get some sun on your skin throughout the day you know block artificial light after not after dark where can cultivate a low light environment turn off your wi-fi router so um it's really it's an easily way to just give it, give it to someone. And even if I can't talk through each point in the consult, um, I will, they'll be, they'll have something to, to read when they go home and they can follow the QR code and watch some of my, my, uh, um, my interviews. But uh, essentially I will, depending on what the problem comes in, you know, often mental health, people with mental health issues, you'll take a history about their circadian rhythm and their light exposures and it's just absolutely up the creek so you know i'll say to them look did you know that that the signals and the the uh, ability for your body to make the key hormone neurotransmitters involved in your mood um you know are, are occurring on exposure to to natural light and they'll be like oh okay that's that's interesting and then if they're on a, a ssri or a, a medication like that i'll say well, look interestingly um these medications work by promoting or reducing the breakdown of the same hormone that you can make yourself when, when you get morning sunlight. So again, it's just about drawing analogies to what they might already know um, and just keeping it really simple. So th- those are the, some of the techniques that I've, I've used. And um, interestingly, also people follow my, people follow my Instagram and I'll po- post about seeing the morning sun and, uh, and wearing blue blockers. And that, that, that can also be a quite, quite a powerful way of of affecting change and i think that's why someone like dr paul saladino always goes through his morning diet because he's constantly getting a new influx of followers and each succession um is learning off him so uh and and that's something that i've been guilty of which is um trying to chase the intellectual you know the more and more complex topics when in reality most people would be would be able to make effective change if we just do the explain the bare basics again and again and again yeah, that's so true. I've I've realized that as well recently, but I think that's really interesting and I think it's it kind of goes with both diet, I mean lifestyle. Like I'm I'm curious as well the the pushback you get because well first off I think what you're doing is very clever. I think leading by example, a and showing people that on social media and letting them know, "Hey, you can learn here, learn more and see what I do." Like I'm not just saying stuff. You're obviously 
in good health. So leading by example there is something like Ryan said, like doesn't really exist in, in most GPs. Um, but I'm sure at least I, I feel like red meat, sun, these are topics that are being told to people by these associations, by, you know, dermatologists, by cardiovascular experts, that these things are bad for our health based on, of course, you know, flawed uh, correlative epidemiological studies. How do you combat that? And then also, how do you deal with the very short amount of time you get with patients? And I don't know if it's different in, in your clinic, but one of the biggest issues I see is that we can't really have an effective healthcare system without, you know, just more personalization, more time spent with the patient. So, you know, it's usually like five, 10 minutes. How are you doing? What are you eating? If you're lucky, here are your labs, you know, have a nice day. So how do you combat, I guess, the pushback on, on these controversial topics? And then how do you think, or what's a solution to just being able to spend more time with people? Is it a more decentralized, you know, health coaching model or, is there a way to fix kind of the current system to some degree? Yeah, so I like to point out the inconsistencies in the narratives that are most that are preventing people from from doing what um, you know the lifestyle things that you you guys and I know are, are healthful and um, you know ancestrally appropriate and completely uh, not not talked about until about fifty years ago. So so whether so if this is um, you know. Um, red meat causes bowel cancer. Um, I'll point out the fact that you know it was this was a, a epidemiological study. The uh, decision was made based on a small board of 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 uh, people. You know, six, seven of the twelve of them had an undisclosed uh, dietary conflict of interest because they were vegetarian. And then I'll say the finding was for unprocessed red meat. That you know, I'll talk a bit about how the the effect that they found was, you know, tiny in magnitude compared to the effect that we need in epidemiology to to link link it to lung cancer. So I'll just kind of point out the different facets of and the contradictions that are that are involved in in that that narrative, and and just basically lead the patient to 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 kind of answer their or ask their own questions. So if it's something like um, the the cholesterol and, and heart disease. Well, I'll be like, well, okay. Um, wh what are the other roles of of a low density lipoprotein cholesterol in your body? Well, hang on. Does it traffic? It, it actually traffics energy. Yes. Oh, okay. It can actually um, be involved in the immune response. Okay. And it's also possible. It also uh, carries fat soluble vitamins around the body. So, do you think it's there to kill you? Well, that doesn't really make sense. So, and then when you point out the the role of insulin resistance and the fact that LDL needs to be oxidized to be to be pathogenic. Um, you you really um, you kind of it's like a ring it's like a pincer movement because the the the, ne the mainstream narrative from these institutions that you've mentioned, Tristan, they're along one line of reasoning. But if you holistically um, through uh, attack attack the argument from like multiple angles. You're really pointing out the inconsistencies and then letting people realize and and then yeah, as I said earlier, ask their own questions. Um, and then anyone who's curious will, I think, you know, do their own research and then kind of, I guess, get get an answer. Um, and you know that that approach works for the sunscreen. It works for all these other things that the sunlight that um, you seem to be have been blackballed. Essentially, uh, over over this past couple of of, um, of decades, and es essentially doing incredible amount of harm. Um, but but in terms of and in terms of seeing patients, uh, so I'm I'm lucky. I I, I don't have um, shorter than half an hour with my patients, so I see see everyone in half an hour slots, and I, I don't don't really think I'm going to go any shorter than that because that is enough time for me to take a comprehensive history, um, find out about the dietary and lifestyle things that a patient is doing or not doing, um, and then, yeah, talk through and, and educate them enough. Um, the, we can talk about the socialized and the you know, private and the, the um, Medicare, the private billing system, but essentially I think there's always going to need to be a degree of private paying because when healthcare is completely free, People just seem to be less likely to make 
lifestyle change in my opinion. And I think that for, again, psychological reasons that people value things that they pay for. So uh, I, I like this idea of um, of decentralized, you know, access to to information. The, the difficulty becomes in, in exactly like who's giving that information. And that there, there obviously is a role for a degree of credentialing to make sure people aren't being told that they're unsafe and completely dangerous things. But um, in terms of the m- a medical approach, I think that longer consults and a private billing, um, however much that is going to cost, is is going to be key. And again, you'll only attract people who are willing to make the changes. And, and that's the key point because you don't want this misalignment where you're talking past the patient about lifestyle changes they don't want to make. And the patient's there, um, you know, seeing you but is ne- never intending to, to change anything so you actually want to get alignment and they don't want to pay that much so you want to get alignment so that people who are seeing you are interested in making lifestyle changes they're willing to pay um and they're going to actually action them because that's that's like the icky guy <laughs> that's like the icky guy of the consult because then you, i'm not wasting my time he, the patient's not wasting the time everyone's winning um and again that speaks to this idea of we're only talking to and helping people who are ready we're not here to push lifestyle change onto anyone who's not ready. And I say that to my patients. I said, I'm here to support you no matter what decision you want to make. If you want to take the antihypertensive medication, here's your script. Um, I always will offer that. I'm not there to um, uh, to give people you know, only a lifestyle approach. I'm there to give them a complete holistic approach. Um, and if they choose or they, if medications are indicated 100%, I'll be writing that script for them. Um, and I don't want want anyone listening to think that that's not what they're going to get when they see me i'm simply just emphasizing their lifestyle options and just giving patients more more options if that that they want to take them yeah i think it's important because it's like government handouts free handouts like they don't work like it doesn't psychologically work because then people just expect that and then everyone's going to do something for me and there's no accountability. And I mean, that's what we talk a lot on the show is like personal accountability, responsibility. That's truly decentralization um, because you have to empower somebody to make that change at the individual level. It's not just like do this and do this because I told you it's, you know, here are your options. Here is the lifestyle changes. Here's the script. And, you know, this is what you have to do, but you have to put in the work. So I I think that's great. I think it's also great that you're, you know, seeing patients for at least 30 minutes. Um, We interviewed um, CEO of of Crowd Health, Andy Schooner, on here. Uh, We'll have to link that. It's kind of like a decentralized health insurance system that's also incorporated with Bitcoin here in the U.S. It's pretty cool because it's also like, you know, it's a community aspect and it's only really letting in people who are you know, going to do the work to actually be healthy because that's how these things work. Like the whole issue, and I'm sure it's similar and, and maybe you could shed some light on, on the biggest issues in Australia compared to maybe the U S is like, you know, people don't want to pay taxes for unhealthy people that aren't putting in any effort. And that's really what's unfair. And, you know, it's something my mom's complained to me about for my whole life. And it kind of instilled this value in my mind but yeah, that's, I, I agree. And I, I think that's why like free healthcare just, it doesn't work. I mean, it might work in Europe where like 4 million people are all like the same person and, and value their healthcare or their health, but it, it definitely doesn't work here. So I'm curious if Australia is the same way, I'm assuming so. Yeah. Um, and the, you know, the final point about the lifestyle change is um, it only works if you do it, <laughs> you know, low, low carb or like see the sunrise only works if you actually do it and if you don't do it it doesn't work so you know uh, yeah look the it's the system in australia is basically called medicare um and it's a form of when when a patient sees us in the general practice we can we basically bill the government for a percentage of the fee that that we charge and then the patient has um an amount that isn't covered this was back uh you know 20 years ago or 10 years ago, most consults would be what's called bulk build, which would be there'd be no gap. Essentially, you see the doctor, the government rebate covers all of it and the patient doesn't pay. Um, but over time and and with inflation and the Medicare, I guess, rebates haven't kept up with that inflation so that more and more medical practices have had to charge a gap fee. Um, and 
uh, I think that look, I, I guess I haven't been working in 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 GP long enough to really see that change over time. But what I would assume is that the type of tick and what's called tick and flick medicine is the type of medicine that happens when you have no gap when it's because because the doctor isn't good, wanting to spend a lot of time with the patient if he knows he's only going to get forty dollars for the consult so he's going to minim he's going to go to the absolute minimum amount of time that he'll has to in order to win that essentially rebate from the government so it's an incentive system again we talked about incentives earlier it's about the incentive system and um, that that tick and flick medicine occurs when the incentive system is broken or isn't um, working functionally. So, um, and on the flip side of it, uh, which is, yeah, again, what we talked about earlier, I mean, I, I see colleagues in things like functional nutrition and they charge, you know, $200 an hour and you'll bet that whoever paid $200 an hour with no rebate is actually going to do what they got told. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's uh, it, it's a thorny topic um, and it goes into ideology because people have deep seated beliefs about what what their what their rights and their responsibilities are, especially from from government and, and from a government benefits point of view. Um, yeah, I don't I don't I don't really have an opinion about that publicly. Only to say that psychologically and paying for something is definitely going to be more likely to uh, to be actioned. <laughs> Yeah, no, I would totally agree. I mean, and it's it's sort of like the idea of of making health that incentive. Like like Tristan mentioned, we talked to the the CEO of Crowd Health, and I think they have a really good thing going on with incentivizing health and sort of being there for for mishaps in a sense, rather than sort of having this reliance on on just being able to go in and get a new script for X Y Z condition that you collect over so, so over many decades. That seems to be sort of the norm in the last last little bit in modern society. And so it's about sort of just taking that personal responsibility back. And I think it's it's a little bit unfortunate that I feel like that's not instilled in at least my generation, maybe the generation after mine doesn't seem as instilled. Um, but I think it's through conversations like this that we can sort of maybe take some of that back. But I think, I think health is one of those things that you control 90 Five or more percent of how it's going to turn out for yourself if you just sort of play the game correctly. And it's sort of having that want to get there. And I like that you brought up mental health there earlier, because that's sort of one of the things that's been exploding the last 10 years of, of my life that I've noticed just the immense amount of mental health issues out in the public space and sort of this acceptance towards it, which I think is great. I think it's great to talk about those things. And know that it's safe, have safe space to talk about having mental health issues like anxiety and depression, all these things. But I feel like we're putting the cart before the horse on why these things are happening. I think it's just not known that we have so much control over our own manifest destiny that uh, it's it's just giving that power back to people. And that's sort of what, what we're all about. One last point I want to make about uh, medicine and sort of the functional medicine side is I see a similar thing happen in functional medicine that happens in conventional medicine where they may not give you a script for or a pill for an ill, as I, as I like to say, but they give you a supplement for an ill and you just sort of go in, you pay several hundred dollars, like you said, um, which definitely is good incentive for me, at least. Uh, definitely going to do things if I paid several hundred bucks to go do something. But it also gives you, I think, the same outcome when you just sort of are given all these pills that they don't explain. And so maybe you can talk to sort of the, the, the issues with in even the functional side, the holistic side. Cause I think, I think it's like, everyone's got a bottom line and I'm cool with making money, but I feel like there's, there's still issues that have to be addressed. Yeah, hundred percent. And functional medicine isn't as big in Australia as I believe it is over in the U S but you know, look, I've still had patients who've come in and who've seen a functional doctor remotely and yeah, they, they had to pay, you know, 300, $400 for 45 minute consult. Um, but they also had to pay an exorbitant amount for supplements and for testing. And it turned out the clinic was making money on the testing, um, as well as on the supplements. And, uh, yeah, I agree with you. I don't think that's, that's morally, uh, upstanding behavior. And it's essentially just the, the same, um, the same animal in a different in different clothing uh you just uh, you know you're not prescribing a prescription medication but you're still prescribing you know expensive supplements that may or may not 
may not help. So I I agree, and I, I'm overwhelmingly um, just say, look, if you get most of these nutrients from eating high quality fresh food, <laughs> you know, you're much better off spending that on regeneratively grazed meat um, from you know the, the Jake Walkey, who's the local regenerative farmer here in Albury, and then on, and and fresh oysters every week than um you know some of these these pills but um yeah as you said um ryan everyone's out out to make a buck and 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 unfortunately the functional medicine space can definitely be prone to 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 kind of yeah things like that that isn't isn't in the patient's best interest so yeah i'm i I don't recommend um supplements um a lot of supplements or many at all um and it just again it depends where the patient's at and what their goal is and what 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 we are trying to hope deal with but um yeah it's uh interesting and and that's again credit to to jack cruz and and kind of his school of thought because he's he's literally selling nothing um and there's an industry that's risen around selling things like blue light blocking glasses grounding mats you know all these paraphernalia that help you live in a circadian or appropriate way but the the essence of his doctrine if we want to use that word uh is very much like here's the information you know work it out for yourself um not not selling you anything yeah i think it always comes back to money right and right now we know that money is broken so it uh it leads to a lot of unfortunate situations and people taking advantage of of other people so i would just say you know be skeptical out there even the health influencers you know affiliate links just what are they selling you just just remember at the end of the day that you're how they make money, you as their audience. Um, But there's obviously so much great information, education out there for free. One of them being your podcast, Max. And I I know you have to run. So thank you so much for doing this. Where can people find you? Yeah, so uh, thanks, thanks, Tristan. And thanks, Ryan. Great conversation. My podcast, uh, as you mentioned, is called the Regenerative Health Podcast. And I talk to lifestyle doctors, I talk to um, people in the health space, I talk to regenerative farmers. And the goal, uh, as we mentioned earlier in the podcast, is to really expand um, or extend the the power of the consult by just allowing people to make some, learn more and and make changes uh, themselves. Um, And I would I would say that, and this is a disclaimer, that anyone who is is medicated or sees a doctor for anything um, yeah, please, please see someone before before making any uh, any changes because because if you are medicated, there can be some issues there, and, and this is not medical advice. This podcast, so um, that's where you can find me. It's on all, all the podcast uh, services on Apple Podcasts, on Spotify, uh, on Buzzsprout, and I'm on Twitter and uh, Max M Gulhane MD, uh, and on Instagram, Doctor Underscore Max uh, Gulhane. And uh, for those, I don't know if there's anyone listening in, in Australia, we're going to be a, a consult in, in Albury uh, at the uh, Gardens Medical Group. And I um, we're, we're hoping to have an event. Uh, we're planning an event for early August where we're going to be talking about things like low-carb carnivore, quantum health, and regenerative farming. So, yeah, keep, keep an eye out for that. I um, hope, hope to announce that pretty soon. But yeah, thanks, gents. Thank you very much for having me on. I uh, appreciate it. Thanks so much, Max. Appreciate it. Definitely check out his podcast. It's a great source of information. And thanks all for tuning in to another episode of Decentralized Radio. We'll see you next time.